Hey Optimancers, Chris here. So today I want to do a build video. We're going to be doing a Spore Druid build, uh, but before I get into the build, I want to talk a little bit about what led up to this build. Uh, so a little while ago, I was issued a challenge on my Discord server, uh, and the challenge said, Treant Monk, I issue you a challenge, one that I would love to see you and the rest of the community uh, that would like to partake to. This is a character building challenge, one that I have designed to test the creativity of others and help you all experience what it is like to play without feats or multi-classing and challenge your own conventions, roadblocks, etc. in D&D 5e. Here are the rules. Make a character whatever class you choose. Make several snapshot versions of this character. Uh, you are not allowed to multi-class or take feats until you reach level 10. You are allowed to use only official content you are not allowed to take the Moon Druid, the Fireball or Lightning Bolt spell, the Great Axe, or the Eldritch Blast cantrip. Will you accept this challenge? I promise if you do this, I will donate to your Patreon or another form of one-time payment option of your choice, PayPal preferred. Uh, call it a sponsored video if you want to. Uh, now I mentioned, obviously anyone can make a build filling these requirements. Is there a goal? I, I'm not sure what the challenge is. And I was told, the goal is to break free of many of the crutches players, including yourself, in all your build videos tend to stick to because you feel it's the optimal choice. I would also like to see you test this character in combat or play one in a game with this character. Uh, so essentially what we're looking at is a build that uh, doesn't multi-class. Well, I do that all the time. If you look at my build videos, lots of my builds don't multi-class or take any feats until level 10. Well. Usually I do take a feat before level 10, uh, but most of my builds, if you look at them, we could just alter them uh, so that we take the feats later, we take our ability score increases earlier, and it doesn't make a huge difference to the character. But then I found there were some odd things here. Uh, you guys know I'm not a big fan of the Lightning Bolt spell. Uh, the Fireball spell, lots of my builds don't take the Fireball spell even when it's available. Uh, the Great Axe, this one was odd. I asked about that, and apparently there was some concerns that it was too good uh, if you do critical hits. Uh, now, a Great Sword will generally do more damage than a Great Axe on a critical hit. I assume maybe they're thinking if you do like a Half Orc with Barbarian or something like that. Um, and then this Eldritch Blast Cantrip thing, uh, this really leads me to believe that uh, these rules were made by somebody who maybe isn't very clear on optimizing or min-maxing. Uh, and they, you know, you see this once in a while where they see somebody did a lot of damage with an Eldritch Blast because maybe they're playing a Sorlock build and they had a couple rounds to set up and they had Hexblade. And then they go, oh, Eldritch Blast is too powerful. We're getting rid of that, right? Uh, somebody had a great axe. They happened to roll really well on a critical hit. Oh, that's too powerful. We're going to get rid of that. And it's often anecdotal stuff or... Uh, uh, stuff that just didn't have a lot of data in it. It was more just like an experience and an emotional reaction. Um, but not using those things, not a big deal. Now, I don't have a Patreon, so I asked if they would do a charitable donation instead. They were happy to do so. Uh, so we got a donation to Amnesty International for doing this build. Uh, and I'm told that these were the rules they use in D&D &D time and with a slight bit of add-ons. And I was told that Ultimately, he was hoping to see that I would maybe do a Warlock build or maybe I would do a Druid build with this uh, because those tended to have the most restrictions. Uh, and I decided that I can do a build doing these things. I can absolutely do a build that I would play. Uh, but in addition to that, I think we can learn some things about optimizing and a little bit about how other people view optimizing from this challenge. Now the easiest way for me to handle this is look at some of the builds I've already done that maybe already fit these criteria or are close to it. So if we look at my videos and builds from the past, uh, one of the ones that I did was a pure Warlock build that didn't use Eldritch Blast. Uh, I called it the Hexblade Spellbow and uh, that video is still available if you want to check it out. And I figured it would be super easy to just do that build. Uh, I did take feats before level 10, but I could just switch them and take them later, and the build would still work, uh, and it would fulfill the challenge. Uh, but that 
seemed really boring to me because I've already made that build. Uh, so what I wanted to do was maybe look at another Warlock or Druid build I could do with these uh, restrictions that I felt would still be effective. Uh, and I could potentially do a different kind of Warlock. Uh, I do think that these house rules really push you, even more so. Uh, we're already pushed towards Hexblade, but these rules, by removing Eldritch Blast, it really makes Hexblade the only super effective Warlock option. Uh, and so I'd be doing another full Warlock Hexblade. I don't want to do that. So I figured I would make a Druid. So I was trying to think of concepts for a Druid. Uh, and one of the things that definitely I thought about right away was that um, I've done a build for a Shepherd Druid and I've done a build for a Moon Druid. Now, Moon Druid wasn't allowed with these rules. Shepherd Druid would be so I could take that build and just alter it and it would fit as well. Uh, so I decided, why don't I do a Druid that I just have never done before? Uh, and one of the things I wanted to do is maybe try a race I've never tried before. So I decided, why don't I go ahead and do something with the Tortle? Uh, because the turtle is just something that I have never used before because it's uh, a little bit obscure. It is technically official rules. It came out with the turtle package around the same time as Tomb of Annihilation came out. Uh, but if you play an Adventure League, it's considered part of Xanathar's. Uh, so it is totally legal. It's just something obscure and I've never used it before. And I always thought it would make kind of an interesting druid. It gets a bonus to wisdom, uh, and then it gets a nice uh, armor class base. And I thought, let's take a look at some artwork for Tortle, see if there's something there that really inspires me towards druid. And I found this image right here. Uh, and this image really spoke to me. I love this one. And it was clear to me that this is a spore druid. Uh, and I've never done a spore druid. Uh, and I thought, a spore druid, that's the way I'm going to go with this. And I figured if I'm going to make a character that's a full spellcaster that doesn't have access to feats, then I'm going to be a little bit concerned about concentration. How do I deal with concentration? Well, the best way to protect your concentration is not to get hit in the first place. And if I look at the turtle, they have a good base armor class. If I throw a shield on top of that, it has a really good base armor class. That's actually a pretty good way to protect the concentration. So I decided that's what I would do. I'm going to do a spore druid. Uh, I'm going to do a turtle. I'm going to give him a shield. And that's going to be able to fulfill the requirements of this build. It also would be a character that I would definitely play. Uh, and when I worked out a build, I came up with something that I thought was pretty good at level one and continues being good after that. And I think it would be fun to play and interesting. Now I did look a little bit at this D&D time that uh, these rules are based on. And within D&D time, uh, leveling starts at level one and it is pretty slow. So you could expect several sessions at level one. You could expect several sessions at level two. So this is definitely a concept where I wanted this to be something that would be fun to play right from level one. So I definitely wanted to consider that when I made this build. So we're going to be doing our Spore Druid build with the guidelines that I've presented. So let's get started. So I'm going to do this build as I always do on D&D Beyond. Uh, and we're going to name him Tortally Mossum. Uh, and for character preferences, I'm going to include Magic the Gathering so I have access to the Sport Druid. So the race I'm going to be choosing is the Tortle. So if you are unfamiliar with the Tortle, the Tortle is basically a humanoid uh, tortoise. And they have racial traits of plus two strength, plus one wisdom, uh, and then some uh, racial abilities. Uh, so plus one wisdom, of course, is great for a druid. Plus two strength is not what I would normally consider something I want with a druid. Uh, if I'm going to use strength, it's usually with a melee build. And with a druid, we can use shillelagh and then use our wisdom instead of our strength in melee. So I had to think, how am I going to build this? And I thought, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just lean into the strength and I will use a weapon that isn't shillelagh in combat. And I'll show you how that plays out. Uh, so 
In terms of age, this one is weird for me. Uh, this has nothing to do with the mechanics, uh, and it's not going to affect most of the game, but if I was to evaluate the turtle, one of my criticisms would be the age. They reach adulthood by 15 years and live an average of 50 years. If this is going to be a race that's based on the tortoise and the turtle, I would have thought the age would be more than a human, not less than a human. Uh, it's a minor point, and again, it wouldn't affect most games, but it just sticks out to me as something that's really odd. Turtles are average size, weigh about 450 pounds. Uh, base walking speed is normal at 30 feet. They will have claws. Claws are natural weapons which you can use to make unarmed strikes. If you hit with them, you deal slashing damage equal to 1d4 plus your strength modifier instead of the bludgeoning damage normal for an arm, unarmed strike. The claws are probably something I'm not going to be using very often. My intent will be to use a weapon, but if I was ever caught without a weapon, I would have that option. Uh, then they get hold breath. You can hold your breath for up to one hour at a time. Uh, Turtles aren't natural swimmers, but they can remain underwater for some time before needing to come up for air. Uh, not a big thing, but I would imagine when I'm getting into third level spells and we're looking at spells like maybe water breathing, this would make that at least somewhat redundant for me, though still potentially useful for the rest of the party. This is the big one for me for the turtle, the natural armor. And I think with druids, this is especially good. So due to your shell and the shape of your body, you are ill-suited to wearing armor. Your shell provides ample protection, however. It gives you a base armor class of 17. Your dexterity modifier doesn't affect this number. You gain no benefit from wearing armor, but if you are using a shield, you can apply the shield's bonus as normal. So what this means is that if I have uh, a shield, I'll be looking at a starting armor class of 19. 19 is a fantastic armor class for a first level character. Uh, we can achieve it through other means. If you're taking something like a fighter and you take the defensive combat style, you can achieve a 19 armor class. But for druids, a uh, 19 starting armor class is unheard of. Uh, and many druids would have trouble even getting to 19 even at higher levels once magic armor comes into play uh, because they have that restriction against wearing metal armor. So we can fulfill that restriction and still have a fantastic armor class with this character. The other thing about this is because we are going to not imply our dexterity to our armor class, suddenly dexterity becomes a lot less important for this character, especially if I'm planning to use strength as my primary ability score for melee, uh, because I can use my strength for melee, I can use my wisdom for ranged cantrips, uh, and really the only thing dexterity would affect is initiative. And it's always nice to have a higher initiative, but I wouldn't say it's vital. And then we get shell defense. And I love shell defense, especially for a druid. You can withdraw into your shell as an action. Until you emerge, you gain a plus four bonus to armor class, and you have advantage on strength and constitution saving throws. Well in your shell, you are prone, your speed is zero, and can't increase, you have disadvantage on dexterity saving throws, you can't take reactions, and the only action you can take is a bonus action to emerge from your shell. So, if you are a druid, and then you cast something like maybe a conjure animals, then what you want to do at that point is protect your concentration. If we use shell defense, we can protect our concentration exceptionally well, uh, because not only are we increasing our already good armor class, but we're also getting now advantage on all our concentration saving throws. Uh, so it's going to be very difficult for enemies to interrupt our concentration. Suddenly, all those feats that we normally take with spellcasters in order to protect concentration at lower levels become far less necessary. Uh, so this is a great way, at looking at this from an optimizer's point of view, to deal with the restrictions placed on us while still making an effective character. So once again, when we're talking about these restrictions and creativity, I don't fully disagree that uh, creating restrictions can increase creativity because yes, it is true that we can still build all kinds of different characters without any restrictions. And in theory, we can actually build more kinds of characters without restrictions, obviously. But what I will say is when there are restrictions put onto you that you normally don't have, you start looking at things in different ways. 
it doesn't end optimization. Optimization still occurs. It's potentially more necessary than ever to have an effective character. Uh, the person who issued the challenge said that they had made a Celestial Warlock uh, with these rules, didn't use Eldritch Blast, instead they used some other attack cantrip. And I looked at that and thought, so you've made a character that's not particularly effective because you've taken away options that are effective, and instead of optimizing, you've just made your character worse. But an optimizer can look at these opportunities and just come up with solutions to them. This is a solution. As a turtle, we also get Survival Instinct, which is proficiency in the survival skill. This is probably a skill we wanted anyways as a druid, so it's basically going to be an additional skill for us. And finally, languages can speak and write, Aquan and Common. So our class at first level will be druid. Now our starting proficiencies, we already have survival, remember. Uh, I will want perception on this character. And of course, being a wisdom-based character, perception is going to be additionally good. And then I'm going to want one other skill. And I'm remembering that this character is going to be a spore druid, meaning that I will specialize in spore-like plants um, and things like fungi and stuff like that. So actually, nature to me seemed like an obvious choice here. Then going into background, I kind of thought, what kind of background would a turtle have who is going to end up becoming a spore druid? And if you are unfamiliar with spore druids, spore druids are not nice. Uh, they tend to deal in poisons, and they tend to deal in the undead. Uh, these are not people you're going to want to hang out with. So I figured Hermit really fits for this. And that is going to give me the medicine and religion skills. Both of them are probably skills I wanted to have. Uh, religion, because of course druids are somewhat religious in nature. And medicine is going to fit with my study of poisons and the like. But in terms of tool proficiencies, I definitely figured a poisoner's kit was the way to go. Then in terms of language, I thought if this is somebody who's a spore druid and into fungi and stuff like that, might spend some time in the Underdark, so Undercommon seemed like a pretty obvious uh, language to take. Uh, now let's go into our equipment. So we can take a wooden shield, which we're going to do, and that's going to give us our armor class of 19. Then we can choose a scimitar or any simple melee weapon, and a scimitar will work fine for us. Then we get leather armor, which we won't be wearing and cannot wear, an explorer's pack, a druidic focus, uh, and we can choose the type of druidic focus, and I'm thinking that this character uh, maybe is going to have a totem. And with the Hermit starting stuff, we're going to get a Herbalism kit right off the bat. So then that brings us into our ability scores. I'm going to use a point buy here. Um, I wasn't told what I should be using, and I figure a point buy would be legal unless they said otherwise. Uh, for Wisdom, we're going to make that a 15. That's going to give us our 16 starting Wisdom. And then with Strength, I'm going to go 14, and that's going to give us a 16 starting Strength. That's a really unusual Strength for a Druid. Uh, we're just going a little bit different route here, and this, I think, will help us out quite a bit at low levels. At high levels, I don't think that Strength is going to do much for us anymore. But at high levels, we're going to have great spell casting, so we're not going to be too concerned about it. Then we're going to make sure our constitution is okay, so we're going to give it a 14 starting score. It's going to give us four additional points to put between our dexterity, our intelligence, and our charisma. A spore druid who's a hermit, I figure, is not going to have a good charisma, so I have no problem leaving that at 8. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make my intelligence and dexterity both 10. So that brings us into our spells, uh, and we're going to begin with our two cantrips. Uh, the first cantrip I want to take is Guidance. Guidance, I think, is the best cantrip a druid can get. Uh, and the second one I want to take is I want to take something maybe that is an attack cantrip and maybe can be used at range. Uh, and Frostbite was the first one I considered. That would give me a 60-foot range. It does hit Constitution, which isn't the best thing to hit. Uh, but then I decided what I would go for instead was Thorn Whip. Now, Thorn Whip, technically speaking, isn't a ranged attack. It's a melee attack. But we can attack creatures up to 30 feet away with it. So it is somewhat ranged regardless. Uh, and one of the nice things about Thorn Whip is in addition to doing damage, it pulls the enemy 10 feet towards you. There's all kinds of utility uses for that. There's all kinds of ways we can combine that with other spells to be useful as well. Uh, so I really like Thorn Whip here. I also figured that a character who is a Spore Druid 
it was a little more thematic as well uh, because it kind of fits with the idea of we're using plants and that kind of thing for our attacks. And that brings us into our spell selection. And the first one I definitely thought I would take would be Entangle. Again, this is going to be a little bit more of a plant-based druid. Entangle is a plant-based spell, and it is a very effective spell. It's going to give us a battlefield control that's really going to help us. It creates a 20-foot square where enemies make a strength saving throw, and if they fail, they're restrained. And of course, restrained will give me advantage on attack rolls as well, and my uh, allies will get advantage on attack rolls, and those enemies would have disadvantage on attack rolls. Another spell I definitely wanted to take was Goodberry. I think Goodberry is maybe your best first level healing spell. I like it more than Healing Word uh, because you can heal up to 10 different allies, one hit point each. Uh, and 10 hit points is more healing than we would expect from a first level spell as well. Uh, so I like Goodberry. It's usually something that I would just expand a spell slot uh, right at the end of the day if I have a spell slot left. And then it's going to last until the next time I take a long rest. Now between Entangle and Goodberry, that's probably going to be using both my spell slots. Uh, so I figure that rituals are the way to go after that. Detect magic is always going to be useful. And I figured just to be a little thematic here, let's go with Detect Poison and Disease. Not sure how much I'm going to use that, but it's a ritual. I'm not using spell slots on it, and it definitely fits thematically with the character. And remember, this character is being built for a game where we would expect to remain level one for some time. So we definitely didn't want to make a character that wasn't going to be effective at level one. I think this character is effective at level one. 19 armor class is a fantastic armor class for first level. I wouldn't expect to get hit a lot. Uh, 10 hit points will be enough with that 19 armor class for a melee character. Uh, and then in combat, I'll be able to use a scimitar. Scimitar is going to have a plus five to hit for a d6 plus three damage. Not going to be as much as some of the martial characters, but that's reasonable damage, especially for a spellcaster in melee. And unlike something like Shillelagh, it's not going to use my bonus action. If we come across magic weapons in the game, it's not going to affect my ability to use those. Uh, so I think there are some advantages to going the strength route rather than the Shillelagh route. Thorn Whip will be something I can do if somebody's not in melee range. I am still going to be limited to a range of 30 feet, uh, and that's just the way it is. Uh, we do have spells that have a longer range than 30 feet already, and we will get more spells later, so we will have more things we can do at range as we level up. But for first level, I would imagine most of the time we can get within 30 feet of an enemy. If enemies are a long distance away, or they're clustered, or at the beginning of the battle I just want to uh, do a battlefield control, uh, or we're in a very tough combat. That's when I want to use my Entangle spell. Uh, my Entangle spell is going to be the most effective thing this character can do at first level, and we can potentially restrain groups of enemies with it. Other than that, I'll probably cast Good Berry every day. It's going to give us 10 points of healing. Uh, again, we can split it up however we want. Uh, and then Detect Poison and Disease and Detect Magic will be in our pocket for use when we need them. Should I have to make a concentration save, we're looking at a plus two bonus right now, uh, but fortunately with a good armor class, we're not going to have to make as many of those saves, and we do have the ability to withdraw into our shell if we need to. So if we get a ton of creatures uh, caught in an entangle, and it's really important we maintain it, we may even want to do it at this point, uh, retreat into the shell so we get advantage on those saving throws, and we're even harder to hit. So we're going to go to level two here. This is going to be the point where we become a spore druid. So as a Spore Druid, the first thing we get is Halo of Spores. Halo of Spores, uh, so we're surrounded by invisible necrotic spores that are harmless to you till you un unleash them on an enemy creature. When a creature you can see moves into a space within 10 feet of you or starts its turn there, now as a melee character, we would expect this to come up reasonably often, you can use your reaction to deal 1d4 necrotic damage to that creature unless it succeeds on a constitution saving throw against our spell DC. We're using our reaction to do 1d4 damage to one enemy if it fails a constitution saving throw. Uh, not a good ability. Am I going to use it at second level? Absolutely. I'll use it every chance I get. How many reactions am I expecting to take? I mean, I don't have any reaction spells yet. Uh, so other than opportunity attacks, which don't come up all the time, uh, Halo of Spores will come up all the time. And maybe half the creatures will save, maybe more than half the creatures will save. But 
we're probably still talking about one or two extra points of damage every round. I'll take it. Then we get our wild shape, as every druid does at second level. Not particularly effective in terms of combat when we're talking about a druid that's not a moon druid. Uh, and that is certainly true of the spore druid. And in reality, I probably won't be using my wild shape much for wild shapes with this character. Instead, what I'm going to do with my Wild Shapes is I'm going to use this ability, Symbiotic Entity. At second level, you gain the ability to channel magic into your spores. As an action, you can expend a use of your Wild Shape feature to awaken those spores rather than transforming into a beast form. And you gain four temporary hit points for each level you have in this class. That's a lot of temporary hit points. Even at second level, that's eight temporary hit points. While this feature is active, you gain the following benefits. When you deal your Halo of Spore damage, roll the damage die a second time and add it to the total. So now we're doing 2d4. It's still not a lot, but if we were doing 2 points of damage a round before, now we're doing 4 points of damage a round. That starts to add up. Uh, again, it's not a huge amount of damage, but when we're adding on top of the damage we're already doing, what it does is it takes a character that probably wasn't matching the marshals in terms of damage, and then it brings it up to a much closer level. Uh, and then our melee weapon attacks deal an extra D6 poison damage to any target they hit. Uh, now, we can have a long conversation about poison, and poison is problematic. But the fact is, especially at low levels, most creatures aren't immune to poison. Uh, if we're fighting undead, the poison isn't going to help. But there are lots and lots of creatures that are going to take that damage. So then once we're doing the additional spore damage, and we're doing the additional weapon damage, this character is suddenly going to start to do damage that might be more than some of the marshals. In addition to that, we're going to have an armor class that's better than most of those marshals, especially those marshals that are concentrating on damage. And on top of that, we're going to have full spell casting from a pretty good spell casting list. So can we optimize using these restrictions? Absolutely. The benefits last for 10 minutes or until we lose the temporary hit points or until we use wild shape again. Uh, so eight temporary hit points is going to last a reasonable amount of time when we combine it with an excellent armor class. At this point, we're going to get one additional spell known and one additional casting of first level spells. I'm still probably going to be casting good berry every day. It's going to be one of those slots. Entangle, can I use it twice a day? Absolutely. So my slots are still going to be used up very easily. So I'm thinking what I would like to do at this point is do yet another ritual. Uh, so what I figure I'll do is I'll grab Purify Food and Drink. So at second level, the combat effectiveness of this character has gone up significantly. Because in any combat, we can expect to do a little bit more damage in combat with our spores. It's not a lot. It uses up our reaction that we probably weren't using for anything else. Uh, but if they make the Constitution saving throw, nothing happens. If they fail the Constitution saving throw, they take 1d4 damage. But if you think about a character at this level, it's probably doing about five points of damage around on average. If we can increase that by two, that's a significant increase. And then when we use our wild shape, uh, and we would probably want to hold that off for cases where we can actually prepare for a combat, or uh, with a 10 minute duration, uh, we might be able to do it just in between combats, as long as we're not dealing with short rests or anything like that. And we could potentially have it last for multiple combats. Then we can expect that seven points of damage to suddenly become nine points of damage. Then add some poison damage on top of that. We might be doing 10 or 11 points of damage. That's really good damage for that level. And on top of that, we're casting more spells. Uh, so this character, uh, at these levels where we're playing in a campaign where we can expect to be first level for a long time, we can expect to be second level for a long time. Often with a primary spellcaster, these levels take a long time because we're waiting for good spells to come along. But because this character has a decent melee attack and decent melee options, uh, we're actually going to find that this character is pretty useful at these low levels. Now at level 3, we're going to get access to second level spells. At this point, I probably want to unprepare one of my rituals from first level uh, because we're going to want to prepare a couple second level spells. We will have two castings of second level spells. Uh, so I'm going to unprepare Purify Food and Drink. Depending on the campaign, I might be better taking away Detect, Poison, and Disease. Remember, 
As a druid, we can change these with every long rest, so as the campaign requires, we can take the spells we're most likely to need. Now, there are a lot of good second level druid spells that I would want to take. Uh, one I will definitely want to take is Pass Without Trace. Of course, Pass Without Trace will give the entire party plus 10 on their stealth checks. And remember, I'm playing a character that doesn't have a good dexterity score, but I'm also not wearing heavy armor. So that means that this character doesn't have disadvantage on stealth checks, despite having that 19 armor class. That is really odd. But it's something we can totally take advantage of with Pass Without Trace, because once we're getting a plus 10 on our stealth roll, and we don't have disadvantage, we're going to be reasonably good at stealth. The other one I thought might be really interesting with this character is Spike Growth. Uh, so Spike Growth creates an area of effect uh, where anyone who moves over that area takes 2d4 piercing damage for every 5 feet it travels. Uh, and I thought this might be something that could work really well uh, with our Thorn Whip. So if we have an enemy and they're within 30 feet but they're not in melee range uh, and we have a Spike Growth in that place, if we hit them with a Thorn Whip they're going to add, not only take the damage from the Thorn Whip, but they're going to move 10 feet across the Spike Growth and take 44 piercing damage as well. And in the same method of thinking, uh, if we're talking about first level spells, uh, am I going to use Entangle? I'm still going to use Entangle. I still want it prepared. Uh, it would be something to do instead of Spike Growth. Uh, and I would still want Goodberry. But I can maybe live without Detect Poison and Disease. And I think it might be a good time to grab Thunder Wave for the same reason. Because with a Thunder Wave, not only will we be doing damage potentially to multiple enemies, but we're also pushing them 10 feet if they fail their saving throw. If we have a Spike Growth up, that's 44 additional points of damage to everyone who fails their saving throw. I should mention that as a Spore Druid, there are certain spells that we automatically get known. Uh, and at third level, it's going to be Blindness, Deafness, and gentle repose. One thing I like about blindness, deafness, is it doesn't use concentration and it scales really well. So when you cast it as a second level spell, it's going to affect one target, but when you cast it as a third level spell, it can affect two targets. So that's good scaling without concentration. Uh, and then gentle repose, pretty useless. At fifth level, we're going to get animate dead, which is a good spell, and of course it, it kind of fits with the spore druid. Gaseous form is uh, pretty much utility. It's not something you're going to use in combat. And as a utility, it only comes up once in a while. Um, but it's okay to have on there as an extra spell known. Uh, level 7, Blight, uh, not something I would probably cast very much. And then Confusion is not a great area of effect battlefield control spell. It's not terrible, terrible, but it's worse than the other battlefield control spells, even of a level below that. Uh, so Confusion, again, probably not something I'm going to cast a lot, but I might. Again, it's not a terrible spell, and I do like battlefield controls. Uh, and then level 9, Cloud Kill. Cloud Kill, of course, has the problem that it uses poison damage. This character is going to be highly reliant on poison damage, uh, and that is going to be a bit of a downside. Uh, so I might not use Cloud Kill very much. Contagion, though, is nice. Contagion is a touch spell. This is a character that will be in melee, and it delivers the poison condition, which again, we have the same issue, but it delivers the poison condition without a saving throw, and it also doesn't require concentration. And as long as something isn't immune to being poisoned, that's a pretty debilitating condition to have in combat. Uh, now, if they make enough saving throws in a row, eventually they get rid of it, uh, but there are so many saving throws they have to make, that tends not to happen within the scope of a combat. So you're going to use the Contagion spell and basically that enemy is going to be poisoned until you kill them. So the main thing that's happening at third level is we're becoming much more of a spellcaster and we're still a pretty good melee character. So at the moment, we're kind of getting the best of both worlds. Now, once martial characters get to level five and they start getting extra attack and that kind of thing, this character is not going to be able to keep up in melee. Uh, but at these low levels, when we don't have a lot of spells, we can keep up in melee. So that's why I like this build for this particular kind of campaign, where we're going to have a lot of time in those low levels. This character is going to be effective. When we get into those higher levels, uh, then we're going to transition more to spellcasting and still be effective. So at level four, we get our first ability score improvement, and then that becomes super easy. We can take a feat, uh, and the ability score improvement we want is wisdom. Now, we're still using melee attacks, so there would be some advantage to taking strength, 
but it just wouldn't last. Uh, so we could take strength right now, and yes, it would help our melee attacks at this level, uh, but then at next level, we're going to be falling far enough behind in melee attacks that we're probably going to want to concentrate far more on spellcasting, and that strength just isn't going to do us any good anymore. But wisdom is hitting exactly where we want, because we're going to be focusing more on spellcasting. Higher wisdom means, of course, more prepared spells. It also means a better spell DC and better to hit rolls with spell attacks. Now at 4th level we are going to get an additional cantrip uh, and what I would probably do here is at this level I'm still going to want to use a weapon in combat. Uh, but when I get into melee at higher levels uh, I'm probably going to want to have an attack cantrip to use rather than a uh, weapon because my weapons aren't going to scale. Uh, but my cantrips will. Uh, so if we're looking at a druid and we're looking at melee cantrips I like primal savagery. Primal Savagery does acid damage. Acid damage is not commonly resisted and is doing D10s. Uh, and we're going to be making melee spell attacks, which is going to rely on our wisdom, uh, which is something that we're boosting. Now, at this level, it's just 1D10. That's going to do less than our scimitar. But next level, level 5, it's going to start doing 2D10. At that point, it's probably already better to switch to Primal Savagery. Now, we're getting two additional spells known. Uh, we're a druid. Weirdly, in this campaign, of course, Lightning Bolt is banned, Fireball is banned, Eldritch Blast is banned, and Healing Spirit is not banned. So let's grab Healing Spirit. And we're definitely using up all our spell slots at second level for these spells, so let's grab a ritual for our last selection and locate animals or plants might be a good one. Especially when we have a character that has a herbalism kit and hopefully by this point we've also picked up a poisoner's kit and by having uh, the ability to locate plants we could potentially locate plants that we can use in poisons we can potentially locate plants we can use in healing potions uh, so we can really make use of those tool proficiencies with the combination of this spell that's a ritual and won't use up our spell slots so we're going to go to level five and then from there we're going to go two levels at a time uh, but we'll start with level five because of course level five is a big level for pretty much any character I just want to point out how well Symbiotic Entity is actually going to scale because with four temporary hit points per level, we're now talking about 20 temporary hit points on this character. And we can do those 20 temporary hit points twice for every short rest. So if we assume that we're having two short rests, so that's an additional 40 hit points and then a short rest, 40 more, and then a short rest, and then 40 more. That's 120 extra hit points of damage this character can take at level 5. And we are combining that with an excellent armor class. Now when we're looking at our third level spells, good chance this character is going to be using Animate Dead. Uh, but another spell that I would probably use is Conjure Animals. I've talked about Conjure Animals before. It's a very effective spell for this level as long as you can maintain concentration. Uh, and again, we don't have a feat to help us retain concentration, but we do have racial abilities that help us maintain concentration. So we can conjure animals, retreat into our shell, and it is going to be very unlikely that we're going to lose concentration. So in terms of melee combat, we are losing ground drastically compared to martial characters starting at fifth level, uh, because they're getting extra attack and we are not. And we can use our Primal Savagery, get 2d10 damage, uh, then we have our Halo of Spores to do a little bit more damage beyond that. In the end, it's just not going to add up to nearly as much as a martial character is going to do. Uh, we can still use a melee weapon, we still have a good strength, but it's still just not going to add up because we don't have extra attack and we're not really adding anything to it. Uh, but what happens here at 5th level is now we have enough spells that we can start to treat ourselves like a primary spellcaster. In combat, we might have animate dead that are going to help do damage in combat. We have conjured animals that are going to help do damage in combat. Uh, and we can control the battlefield. Still things like entangle work reasonably well. Spike growth is still going to work reasonably well for us. Healing spirit is something we could do in combat too, though it tends to be more effective outside of combat. So we are going to begin to jump this character two levels at a time. At 6th level, a few things happen with our Spore Druid. Uh, the first thing that happens is our Halo of Spores now does a little bit more damage. It goes to uh, D6 damage, still not great damage, 
but I'm still going to use it with my reaction. I might as well. Remember, if we're using our symbiotic entity, that becomes 2d6 damage. Uh, and then at 6th level, we get Fungal Infestation. At 6th level, your spores gain the ability to infest a corpse and animate it. If a beast or humanoid that is small or medium dies within 10 feet of you, you can use your reaction to animate it, causing it to stand up immediately with one hit point. The creature uses the zombie stat block in the monster manual. It remains animate for one hour, after which time it collapses and dies. In combat, the zombie's turn comes immediately after yours. It obeys your mental commands, and the only action it can take is the attack action, making one melee attack. You can use this feature a number of times equal to your wisdom modifier. Being able to use your reaction, remember, our only reaction really was that kind of crappy Halo of Spores ability. Doing this instead is wonderful. Yes, the creature you bring up only has one hit point, but one hit point means it has to draw an enemy attack, and enemies do way more than one hit point. All that additional damage beyond one hit point is lost. And because it's a zombie, it gets a saving throw, even if it takes more than one hit point, and it still might remain up. Uh, and these don't require your concentration. They're not going to use up your spell slots. They're just for free for an hour. And unlike our regular undead, these ones don't even take our bonus action to command. Yes, we can only command them to attack. That's what we wanted to command them to do. So that's not a problem either. And because we haven't been taking feats, we're raising our wisdom, which means we can use this ability more. Uh, and I love this ability. I would absolutely use it. I think it's flavorful as well. And this is just really cool. Now, the one issue we're going to have is this character is going to have a lot of combatants on the battlefield. We might have our own animate dead. We might be conjuring animals. Uh, and then we might have our fungal infestations on top of all that. So there may be a lot of creatures to control in combat that can bog things down. Uh, again, make sure that you have the zombie combat stats. Give them out to other party members. When you use fungal infestation, give control to one of them. Also at 7th level, we're going to get our 4th level spells. I'm going to take Polymorph. Surprise, surprise. Uh, one other spell that I might want to consider is Guardians of Nature. Uh, because I use strength-based attacks with this character if I'm going to use a melee weapon. Now, I kind of mentioned that we would maybe be moving away from melee weapons. But if I wanted to use this spell, I could potentially make myself reasonably effective in melee again. Uh, because if we do the Primal Beast, we increase our walking speed by 10 feet, we get Dark Vision range 120, we make strength-based weapon attacks with advantage, and they do an additional 1d6 force damage per hit. Remember as well that when we're using our Spore Druid ability, we would do an additional d6 poison damage per hit, so we'd be adding 1d6 force damage and 1d6 poison damage. Now, do I think that makes it worthwhile? No. Uh, I still don't think Guardian of nature is worth it, I do kind of think you would need extra attack to really make that worthwhile. So instead, I would be inclined to take Conjure Woodland Beings. This is a spell I've talked about before as well. Uh, lots of really nice creatures you can uh, pick with it. A lot of them take up less room than Conjure Animals. A lot of them have spell-like abilities or ranged attacks, uh, which also makes them less intrusive sometimes than a Conjure Animals. Uh, and also, they're tend to be less creatures to choose from, so that often makes more predictable results than a conjure animals. Uh, so conjure woodland beings, I think, is absolutely something I want on my list. So that takes us into ninth level. At ninth level, we're going to get our next ability score increase, uh, actually at eighth level, and then that gives us our wisdom score of 20. Our symbiotic entity is now giving us 36 additional hit points every time we use it, or temporary hit points. So that is 72 additional hit points every time we take a short rest. Now by this level, I would probably recommend getting rid of Entangle. We're going to get so many other great concentration spells, we're probably not going to have as much opportunity to use it. I'd be inclined to replace it with Absorb Elements. And we actually have three additional spell preparations here, and fifth level spells available. We don't have three fifth level spell castings though, so again, it's a good time to take a ritual spell. And Commune with Nature is a fantastic ritual spell available to Druids at 5th level. So I will absolutely grab that. Now we have Contagion, which as I mentioned is actually a not a bad spell that isn't going to use our concentration. So I think it is reasonable to look at spells that might use our concentration as alternatives. And Wall of Stone is a really good battlefield control spell. Not as good as Wall of Force, 
though better in some respects. Uh, but definitely the best battlefield control of this level available on the Druid spell list. And Conjure Elemental will be the other one I grab. Again, this is a good summoning spell. Uh, elementals are a lot better than anything we can summon up to now. Uh, they're challenge rating 5, but if we compare them to other challenge rating 5 creatures, they tend to have resistance to the type of damage they're most likely to take and over 100 hit points. So they are very, very difficult to take down. They're getting multiple attacks every round that tend to do reasonably good damage. So we're zipping along here. Let's go to level 11. Uh, so we're now in the point where we can now take uh, feats. And this was another strange thing. We're not allowed to take feats until after level 10. Of course, um, unless you're a rogue, I guess, nobody's getting feats at level 10. <laughs> but anyway, so our next uh, ability score increase comes up at level 12. So happens that we've just used our two ability score increases to increase our wisdom. Now is the point when we would really like to be able to access feats. We're going to be able to do so next level. At 10th level as a spore druid, what we get is spreading spores. At 10th level, you gain the ability to seed an area with deadly spores. As a bonus action, while your symbiotic entity feature is active, that's the one that uses our wild shape and lasts 10 minutes. You can hurl spores up to 30 feet away, where they swirl in a 10-foot cube for one minute. The spores disappear early if you use this feature again, if you dismiss them as a bonus action, or if your symbiotic entity feature is no longer active. When a creature moves into the cube or starts its turn there, it takes your halo of, halo of spores damage unless it succeeds on a constitution saving throw against our spell safety C. Creature can take this damage no more than once per turn. While the cube of spores persists, you can't use your halo of spores reaction. Uh, so basically what we're doing is we're taking our halo of spores and we're moving it. Uh, and this is actually good at this point because we're now far less of a melee character than we were before. We have so many more spells we can cast uh, that quite often we're going to be concentrating on spells. We might often be retreated into our shell, just making sure our saving throws are always good. Uh, so it is actually pretty useful for us to be able to move and send our spores where they're more likely to do damage. And remember that when we have our symbiotic entity going, which we have to in order to use the ability, we're doubling our uh, halo of spores damage as well. So we're going to get another cantrip at 11th level. This is the point where attack cantrips scale yet again. So this is our third scaling of cantrips. Uh, so our primal savagery is now doing 3d10 damage. This is a good point for us to be looking at a range cantrip. And the one I would probably pick up here is frostbite. We're going to get two more spell preparations and we have access to our 6th level spells now. Uh, and there's two 6th level spells that I'd probably look at first. Uh, the first one is heal. Heal is the best healing spell of the game up to this point uh, because we can cast it as one action to heal 70 hit points and we can cast it at range uh, and then for our other one I would look at probably either Bones of the Earth or Wall of Thorns uh, and I'm thinking with this character let's do Bones of the Earth because we have been taking a lot of concentration spells so Bones of the Earth is something we can do in combination with a uh, concentration spell uh, because it doesn't require concentration. But it's a good battlefield control and it's a good way to do some damage to some enemies. Now we're going to be heading into high levels here uh, and we know that spellcasters are good at high levels. We now have access to our feats uh, so we're going to be able to shore up our concentration. So this is really, we're not going to really feel the effects of the uh, house rules here beyond this point. Uh, at 13th level, we're going to get another ability score increase with this character. I would be inclined to go with Warcaster. Warcaster is basically going to mean we don't have to use our shell ability anymore uh, because we're always going to have advantage on those concentration saving throws. Also, this is a character that is more likely to get into melee range and being able to cast a spell as a reaction for an opportunity attack is something that might come up. Something like a Primal Savagery is going to do reasonably good damage on a opportunity attack. We are going to get access to 7th level spells. We're going to have two more preparations. We're only going to cast one of these spells. Uh, so one of them maybe should be some kind of out of combat utility once in a while kind of thing. And I think that's plane shift. That gives us one additional spell. Uh, and I would think reverse gravity is a pretty good uh, battlefield control spell. Now I wanted to talk about uh, going up to 14th level. So we're going to go to 15th level. And this is where uh, the Spore Druid gets the ability that I think really is the best one for this subclass. And that's Fungal Body. 
At 14th level, the fungal spores in your body alter you. You can't be blinded, deafened, frightened, or poisoned, and any critical hit against you counts as a normal hit instead, unless you're incapacitated. So that is a lot of immunities. Blinded, frightened, deafened, and poisoned. And you're immune to critical hits. Uh, and just remember to just the massive amount of temporary hit points we're adding now. Our symbiotic entity adds 60 hit points. Remember, we can do that twice every short rest. Uh, so that's 120 hit points additional between every short rest. And our halo of spores now does the maximum amount of damage, which is a d10 damage. Two more spell preparations. We can now cast 8th level spells. Not a huge fan of the Druid 8th level spell list, uh, but I'd probably take Antipathy Sympathy. Now, Antipathy Sympathy tends to be something that we cast outside of combat. So we probably want one more 8th level spell uh, that we would cast in combat. And I would take Tsunami here. I don't think it's a great spell, but as a battlefield control, it's okay. And it does damage on top of that. So we're getting a bit of a combination of a blast and battlefield control. Uh, and not a great spell, uh, especially for an 8th level slot, but it's probably as good as any other battlefield control or blast that this character can do. And I'm going to just finish this character up with 17th level. I don't think we need to take it to 20th level. Uh, I'm not sure how often D&D time gets past 17th level or even to 17th level, uh, so I'm not sure how relevant it would be. Uh, I think I've shown that this character can be reasonably effective from level one. Uh, but ability score improvement, I would take another feat and I'd take resilient constitution. And then we get ninth level spells, and there are a couple really good spells here. Foresight and Shape Change are both fantastic spells. Uh, I'm going to grab Foresight. I think it's a little more flexible because, of course, we can use it on ourselves or somebody else. And what I want to kind of do here is just finish up with this summation. Uh, so this character, Spore Druid, it is not much different than a Spore Druid I would make without any house rules at all. Uh, I probably would take some of those feats earlier on. I probably would take the ability scores later on. That's pretty much the only difference. Uh, otherwise, this is totally a character that I would make without house rules. And when I look at the house rules that they have instituted for D&D time, this is what I see. I see a set of house rules that strangely seems to dislike warlocks that aren't Hexblade. Uh, and if you're going to be a character that is effective, that's a Warlock, that isn't a Hexblade, you're probably using Eldritch Blast, or you're multiclassed, and this doesn't allow multiclassing either. So a straight class Warlock without Eldritch Blast is just going to be less effective than other classes, and the Hexblade subclass. And the Hexblade subclass was already the best Warlock subclass, so you're pushing people even harder into what was already the best option not allowing battle axes. Well, this is just strange because battle axes are iconic in fantasy. Removing them just removes something that we would expect a character that maybe wants to be kind of a Gimli style character is going to use. Uh, or maybe they're going to be a half-orc barbarian. We would expect them to use a battle axe. And now they might choose something else, but taking away that most iconic selection from them again, is strange because it's not the most optimal choice. Uh, so what you're doing is you're taking something away and you're not accomplishing anything with it. Uh, and doing things like not allowing multiclassing is fine. I mean, multiclassing is an optional rule. Not allowing feats, that's fine. Feats are an optional rule. Uh, but these other things you've done, Lightning Bolt isn't a great spell. Uh, I showed you some great spells today, a lot of them. Most of them are better than Lightning Bolt for their level. Not allowing Lightning Bolt, I'm not sure what you think you're accomplishing there, uh, but all you're doing is you're taking what is a mediocre spell and you're just removing it, and I don't know why. Uh, and Fireball, Fireball is a good spell, but it's not a fantastic spell. Uh, if I am a class that has access to Fireball, uh, I'm either a cleric and I'm getting it automatically because I'm a light cleric, in which case I don't get it, so I guess you just get screwed. Uh, or I'm playing a sorcerer or wizard, and in both cases there are better options for me than Fireball, unless I'm playing a blaster, and a blaster isn't always the best way to go with either of those classes. So I don't know what you think you're accomplishing with these house rules. I think you think you're preventing some optimization, but you're not. What you're doing is you're punishing players that aren't optimizers. 
optimizers, we know how to work around your house rules because you haven't prevented the good options. You prevented mediocre options that people sometimes take instead of taking the good options. That's fine, I'll just take the good option instead. But I'll tell you what, even if you were to take all the good options away, a good optimizer is just looking at what's left and they're still going to pick the best options of what's available. Uh, optimization isn't about um, whining if you don't get all the best options. Optimization is about knowing what the best options are within the framework that you set. Uh, so hopefully uh, I've gotten that across. Uh, and this is a character that I would absolutely play. I think it's effective at level 1. I think it's effective at level 20. And I think that uh, this is a character that wouldn't be much different if I made it without house rules. And frankly, uh, the Spore Druid was mainly because I wanted to try out a Spore Druid. This could be a Land Druid. This could be a Shepherd Druid. This could be a Circle of Dreams Druid. And I don't think that you would see a lot of changes. So that's it. That is my charity build. Uh, the Spore Druid Turtle Druid. Next week I'm going to get back into the Artificer because I want to look at the Artillerist, which I also think is reasonably good uh, and I haven't done a build for it yet. So we're going to do a build for it next week and until then I'm going to sit back, relax, have some fun. Merry Christmas everyone. D&D is for everyone and I'll see you next time.